Well, hello, my friends. How's it going? Welcome to D&D Optimized, part of the D4 network. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons and & Dragons, and we crunch numbers about them, we theorycraft about them, in an attempt not to tell you the best way or the right way to create a character, but to explore one potential option for creating a character in hopes of making something that's both very fun to play in game, but also powerful. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas for a particular character that you would like to play, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I'm really happy that you're here. So thanks for being here. My name's Colby, and I'll be your host. Before we jump in today, a a little bit of some kind of cool and fun news, I think anyway. We're working on merch, right? So, oh, let me give you a better view here of the D&D-O shirt. We don't have the store live yet. We're kind of testing and sampling some sizes and designs and making sure we like the fabric and all of that kind of stuff. But stay tuned, soon we should have something live. And in the meantime, feel free to offer suggestions if there's something that you think you might like to see, whether a design or like a particular item, like a beanie or a sweatshirt or, you know, a baby onesie, something in addition to just t-shirts. Anyway, that's a lot of fun. And, And feedback too is great. Like, I really like this, but I feel like the colon maybe needs to go away because it makes it feel off-centered. Anyway, feedback's great, and um, if you've got suggestions or ideas, let me know. On to the episode. I have had many requests to do a Bard Paladin build in the past. Palabard? A Bardadin. I've also had a lot of requests to do a Barbarian Paladin build. A Palarian. No, a Barbaladin. What I haven't actually had a lot of requests for, but I know that deep down inside, you all really want to see, is a Bardbarian. <laughs> right? The Bardbarian. This is, this is usually something that people just laugh and make memes about. A musician who rages. But I get it. You want to sing. You just want to sing angrily. <laughs> While thrashing with your axe. Wouldn't that be hilarious? It might be. It might be hilarious, but you know what else? it might be awesome, both story-wise and mechanically. So you guys want to see if we can make it work? Because I do. Let's do this. Let's combine all three. The Bard, the Paladin, and the Barbarian into a Barbarian of Righteousness. Their conquests will be glorious and their tales will be legendary. We are here to lead people down the path that rocks which in our case also happens to be the path of righteousness. Okay, so the first question that we need to ask ourselves when building this barbarian of righteousness is this, what is the main thing that we would build this character for? Is it tankiness? Probably not. Sustained damage? Seems unlikely. When I think about a bard, I think most of their abilities and spells make them fantastic for like a support and utility role above all else. Unfortunately, there is a little problem when combining barbarians with spellcasters, right? Barbarians and spells don't mix particularly well, or at least not particularly easily, because you can't concentrate on or cast spells while you're raging. And yet, you have all of these bard levels and spell slots. One approach here would be to do what I basically did with the Spore Druid Beast Barbarian Spore Beast build uh, a few months ago, and basically just like take a bunch of utility and out of combat spells, just plan on using those to heal up and and be kind of a Swiss army knife outside of combat. And so, yeah, I think that will be part of our approach here. But what else could we do with those spell slots in combat? Hmm. The answer, of course, is Divine Smite. As most of you know, even though barbarians can't concentrate on or cast spells while they're raging, they can use spell slots while raging to add Divine Smite to their attacks. As using Divine Smite is very specifically not casting a spell, even though it's using a spell slot. And this is probably my favorite use of spell slots as a barbarian. And so, 
if we're creating a character who can use limited resources to smite and maybe another trick or two that we pick up along the way, I think that in addition to providing great utility and support, this is a character who can potentially really excel at Nova or burst damage. Doing a ton of damage once in a while can be just as if not in some cases more valuable, I think, depending on the situation than doing low resource, high sustained damage per round, in my opinion. So. The goal of this character then will be twofold. One, offer some really nice support and utility, and also, eventually at least, provide some really top tier Nova or burst damage. So that is what we're going for with the build today. Episode 71, the Barbaridan, the Palbardian, the Zealous Barbarian. Have to give a very special shout out to my friend Randall Hampton, who did some fantastic artwork for this character concept. I love it, and I know I say this often, but this is hands down my favorite piece that he's done so far. I mean, it looks like if Slash from Guns N' Roses was a D&D character, right? It's absolutely perfect. <laughs> so big thanks to Randall. And actually, let me plug as well a couple of books that he's got right now on sale. So Randall, in case you don't know, creates these books. It's sort of like Diary of a Wimpy Kid, but for D&D. And there are these fantastic stories about kind of like introducing Dungeons and Dragons to kids and helping them kind of understand how it works. The artwork is fantastic. The story is great. I, I love reading them with my kids. And, uh, and Randall was kind enough to send me both of the books that he's done to date as Christmas presents. And so you guys should definitely check it out. I'm going to put a link in the video description for where to go to get these books. They're on sale right now, only $25 for the pair of them. So support Randall. He's a great artist and a good friend. Get your kids or your nieces or nephews or neighbor kids or neighbor friends a couple of books that I think they will really enjoy. Also, before we jump into the build, I need to give a shout out to the sponsor for this week's video, Son of Oak Game Studios tabletop role-playing game City of Mist. They sponsored a video a couple of weeks ago. You guys, this RPG looks pretty fantastic. If you love tabletop role-playing games, but you think maybe once in a while you might want to take a little break from D&D, you ought to check out City of Mist. It's a really cool game world and concept. It's basically Dungeons and Dragons meets a modern day setting with a healthy heap of noir and sort of a detective comic feel to it. Reminiscent, like I've said before, of like American Gods by Neil Gaiman to me, or especially maybe the Dresden Files series of books by Jim Butcher. It's a little bit D&D, &D, it's maybe a little bit cyberpunk. And this week, Son of Oak actually was kind enough to send me a big box of stuff so that I can actually show you guys some of the content. And, and, and this is my first unboxing that I've ever done. So I think I'm probably doing it wrong. I'm not sure. I, I probably should have opened this before and then like pretended that I was opening it for the first time on camera, but I'm actually just opening it for the first time on camera. <laughs> Maybe that's a rookie mistake, but let's check out what they sent. Okay, let me put this down. All right, so we've got the starter box. Nice. Ooh. Oh, wow, like a bunch of awesome maps. <laughs> That's super cool, check that out. These are like uh, part of the kind of starter campaign that you get that I'm sure would come in handy. Ooh, even some tokens to keep track of players and PCs. And then it looks like we've got like some, some PCs that you can play as with this fantastic artwork and sheet that you can just use if you just want to jump right in, as opposed to, you know, try and figure out how to create your own character, maybe for your first, for your first foray. Lily Chow. Whoa, now that's a pet class. So you've got a quick kind of player guide here and the Master of Ceremonies, which is sort of the GM or DM equivalent for City of Mist. So that's the starter box, everything you need to get going for your very first foray into City of Mist. And then, oh, this is awesome. And I've got a couple of like sort of the full, the full um, player's guide and MC toolkit here. So like the player's guide and the dungeon master's guide essentially, right? This is quality stuff, you guys. I mean, check out the artwork. I mean, it, it is like right out of a graphic novel. How to create your own story. Who are you? Oh, that's so cool. I wanna play that guy or maybe fight him. 
Ooh, a fantastic Master of Ceremonies screen. It's got all the important information and some killer artwork, which is just par for the course here. And then they even sent me a couple of the official modules, the official adventures. Uh, Shadows and Showdowns, and then w the one that they just barely released called Knights of Pain Town. So first up, it's got a bunch of cool just like cutouts and cards and things that obviously, like you as the Master of Ceremonies, would want to use and like give to your players at certain points in these adventures to kind of show them what they have, letters, descriptions, even little like puzzle things. <laughs> That's awesome. I love handouts as a player. Ooh, and a map. A map of the city. I do love maps. <laughs> oh, check that out. That is massive. Lakeside Drive, La Colonia de Sombras, Chinatown, Little Italy, White Cliff, Old Quarter, and then Shadows and Showdowns. I mean, this thing's 300 pages long, you guys. It looks pretty legit. Filled with story, Characters, plot hooks, locations, magic items, monsters, NPCs, and as always, amazing artwork. And then Knights of Pain Town, the brand new one, where the streets bleed neon. You've got your hooks, you've got your steel jawed acrobats, you've got your zombies. Man, this is, I mean, if it wasn't apparent from my previous endorsement. They spared no expense on this stuff. It is incredibly high quality and it looks amazing. I can't wait to dive into this even more. So huge thanks to Sun of Oak Game Studios. I hope you guys will check them out. Again, make sure you look in the video description for a link on how to get to all things City of Mist. Please do use the link. That way they know that you heard about them from me. Give it a try. Spend some time over the, over the holiday break to learn a new game system. Try it out. I think that's what I'm going to do as soon as I get some time off. All right, let's jump into the build. At level one for your class, you know what? I agonized over the class and level progression for this character for literally hours, more than I've done for a build in a really long time. You guys would laugh if you knew how much time I spent going back and forth and back and forth here. I basically wrote like two complete scripts for this build, not knowing which one I was going to end up using until at the last minute. Here are the challenges. First off, I knew that as a melee character, I wanted to get extra attack. For a Bard Barian, that meant I either needed to go Barbarian 5 or Bard 6, ideally as quickly as possible. Now, as a character who was focused on burst damage, who was planning on building around Smite, among other things, eventually, there was a very clear and obvious incentive to try and get that extra attack feature from bard levels. Because, as most of you know, when you're building a character around smiting for burst damage, there is a clear advantage to getting a lot of levels in a full caster class for quicker and better spell slot progression. The more spell slots you have, the more often you can smite. The higher level the spell slots, the bigger your smites are. And thus, I knew that I was going to tr be trying to get as many bard levels as possible, especially because we're building a bard barbarian. So it made the most sense to me to pick up that extra attack feature from bard levels, as opposed to barbarian. Add to that the fact that, in my opinion, as much as I love barbarians, and I do, they are one of the most front-loaded classes in all of D&D 5th edition, meaning most of the best features that you get from the class, I think, come at very early levels. And after those first few levels of Barbarian, the features that you pick up, generally speaking, aren't quite as amazing. And thus, it might not behoove us to invest a bunch of levels in Barbarian mechanically speaking, anyway. And so it seemed to me like the best choice for this character was to try to get to Bard 6 as quickly as I can. So we're starting with Bard, right? Not so fast. The problem is, since this character is going to be melee, I just couldn't, in good conscience, send them into combat with only light armor proficiency, d8 for hit points, and no damage resistance, which is what we would have if we just started with Bard for six straight levels. I was originally going to do it anyway, but I couldn't sleep at night. I felt so guilty. You just would not survive unless you had the kindest DM in the world. And not only that, but 
I really wanted this character to use an axe. I mean, you are kind of the ultimate metalhead, right? You are raging into the microphone. You've got to have an axe for a weapon. And bards don't start with proficiency in battle axes or great axes. Throwing axes aren't real axes, they're like hatchets. So that actually was a big part of the decision, as silly as that may sound. Finally, I really wanted to be a barbarian as soon as possible and not wait until level seven to be one. So in the name of both survivability and character, and at the cost of delaying our extra attack for one more level, we are going to start at level one as a barbarian. So yes, when we first meet our character, they are a bit of an uncivilized brute. They have aspirations though. They want to see the world. They want to learn to perform. They might even want to evangelize for their deity and convert the godless heathens, though I think their conversion tactics might be a bit suspect. I will inspire you to choose righteousness with my music, but if you fail to be moved, you might find my axe blade a little more convincing. As for our race, we are going to be about as mad a character as I've built. For that reason, I would not blame you at all if you wanted to take, say, half-elf or even a mountain dwarf here just for, like, the superior stat bonuses. I'm gonna go variant human, not custom lineage, because I want a free feat, of course, but I also want to get plus one to two stats rather than plus two to one stat. Feel free to go a different route if you are tired of the variant human custom lineage options. As for what that free feat should be, I'm going to take dual wielder. Whoa, I have never really done a two weapon focused build before the Eldritch Blade Master like a month ago and now I've done two in the space of just a few weeks. What gives? Here's what gives. I've already said I want to commit to the axe for this build, but also this build is going to want to get as many attacks per turn as possible so that we can smite more often, among other things. That means we either need to go with a polearm master build for the bonus action attack, or maybe use a double bladed scimitar, or go with two weapon fighting. Obviously, going polearm master and then picking up great weapon master is a viable option here, but first off, like I said, really want to commit to the axe, and there are no real polearm axes. I mean, the halberd is sort of an axe on a stick, but it's just like a little baby axe. Not good enough. And of course, the double-bladed scimitar need not apply. Mechanically, though, I don't actually want to go with the Great Weapon Master feat here for our Nova rounds, at least. And the Nova damage is really what I'm trying to focus on with this build, as I've said. It may seem counterintuitive, but the reality is that during those Nova rounds, we're going to be adding a lot of damage to our hits via Smite and other things. And the more damage that you're piling onto a hit, the more important it becomes to, well, hit. So even though the plus 10 damage that we get from Great Weapon Master is fantastic, that minus five to hit penalty when you turn it on is really detrimental during our Nova rounds. You would actually be like turning off the Great Weapon Master feature at very low enemy armor classes. I'm talking like 13, 14, which is basically gonna be almost all the time. Again, at least during the Nova round. And so if we're not gonna be taking the Great Weapon Master feat, then there's not a real numerical advantage to going Polearm Master over, say, Dual Wielder, if we're going to be taking the two-weapon fighting style, which we will be, spoiler, spoiler alert. alert. And so if one method lets us dual wield battle axes instead of a little baby axe on a stick, then I think the more metal option is definitely to go double battle axes. It's like now we have our main axe for, you know, welcome to the jungle, but every once in a while we can pull out our acoustic axe when we want to do patience. And also, of course, dual wielder gives us a nice little plus one to our armor class if we're wielding a weapon in each hand. And as we will see, our armor class is not going to be great, so that little plus one bonus will be welcome. As for our ability scores, I'm assuming as always that we are using the point by method, and so I'm going to recommend taking a 15 strength with a plus one there from Variant Human, a 15 charisma with a plus one there, and then a 14 constitution and a 10 dexterity. So yes, we're going to be a medium armor wearer with a plus zero to our dex. I know, it hurts. We could take a lower charisma score to maybe bump our survivability, but I really want to commit to the bard aspect of this character here. 
I want to be a good performer, even if it makes me more squishy. You do what you got to do. We could also, of course, swap those constitution and dexterity scores if we want to get a higher armor class at the cost of our hit points, but I'll talk about why I think a better constitution score is more important in just a second. As for equipment, I'm going to recommend the gold buy option and then purchase some scale mail, two battle axes, and of course an instrument that's not an axe, and whatever other necessities you may have. And then, as a barbarian at level one, we get rage, and any good metalhead knows the value of raging. So twice per day, as a bonus action, we can go into a rage, which means that so long as we either take damage or make an attack every turn, for one minute we will have advantage on our strength checks and strength saving throws, add two damage to our strength-based melee weapon attacks, and have resistance to bludgeoning piercing and slashing damage. And as I will always remind everyone, most of the damage that we will be taking throughout our character's career at most tables and most D&D campaigns is going to come in the form of bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. So this means that we will be taking half damage on most of the damage that we'll be subject to, and that's just really, really great, and it's why I value a high constitution score here over dexterity. Our armor class, frankly, is never going to be amazing, and eventually our enemies are even going to have advantage against us when they're attacking us. So the truth is that we're just going to be getting hit a lot, regardless of whether our AC was too higher or not. But every single hit point for us is almost like having two hit points compared to our non-raging companions. So I'm going to prioritize a higher constitution score. And then also, as a barbarian at level one, we get unarmored defense, which tells us that our armor class is equivalent to our dexterity modifier plus our constitution modifier if we're not wearing armor, but maybe on some other character. We are not going naked. We're better off with scale mail. We're sitting then now at a 15 armor class with the dual wielder feet. Again, not fantastic, but at least we have rage to help us shrug off most of that damage. All right, at level two, we are going to be a bard level one. Like I said, if I'm gonna build a barbarian, I want to be a barbarian as soon as possible and not delay bard levels for this character. And there are mechanical reasons as well, like I said, though we don't really get to enjoy most of those until several levels from now, at least damage-wise. Now, if you wanted to go barbarian too here for reckless attack, I wouldn't blame you, but we are putting off extra attack too long for my taste as is, so I'm just gonna start into bard levels now. So yes, you have begun your musical journey. You're probably playing in the seediest taverns because they're the only ones desperate enough for your inexperienced talent. Or maybe you're even just a busker at this point, playing on the street corners, not for filthy gold or lucre, but to spread the important word of your deity. So as a bard one, we get, of course, bardic inspiration. So right from the get-go, you have found that you have a gift to inspire others with your zeal and conviction. Charisma modifier times per day, which is three for us now. You can, as a bonus action, give bardic inspiration to an ally. It lasts for 10 minutes and lets them roll an extra d6 for now, that'll scale later, uh, to one ability check, attack roll, or saving throw. And then of course we get spells as a bard one. And you're going to hear this a lot from me for this character, but since barbarians again cannot concentrate on spells or cast spells while raging, you're gonna to wanna to focus I think on spells that have sort of out of combat utility and support function for the most part, especially grabbing rituals when you can because bards are ritual casters. So I'm gonna say, pick your favorites. Mine would be things like mending and message for cantrips, prestidigitation, of course. You gotta have lasers during your performance, right? And then, you know, things like cure wounds, feather fall, detect magic, identify, and speak with animals maybe even, etc. for your first level spells. At level three, we're going to be a bard two. Yeah, we're gonna stay with bard levels here for some time as our character seeks to hone their performance and persuasion skills to most effectively follow the path that rocks. So as a bard two, we get jack of all trades, that quintessential bard feature. Jack of all trades lets you add half of your proficiency bonus to any ability check where you are not adding your proficiency bonus already. As many of you have pointed out to me in the past, this includes your initiative bonus, don't forget that, uh, which is always really nice, especially with our lowly dexterity modifier. And then doubling down on our, this character brings a lot of utility and support outside of combat theme, we get Song of Rest here as well, 
which lets you add a d6, and that will scale over time, of additional hit points in healing when an ally spends hit dice to recover hit points during a short rest. And I would be really curious to know what your Song of Rest would be for this character. Let me know in the comments. At level four, we would be a Bard three, and we get second level Bard spells, again, Pick your favorites, plenty of fantastic non-combat options here. Calm Emotions is a standout one for me and would be, I think, really great, especially if your barbarian is more of a hippie rocker than a metalhead, right? Maybe you're more Grateful Dead than Death Metal. Hey man, let's just calm down, everyone. Like trying to stop a fight from breaking out, or maybe just a good one to pull out if you are out of rage uses for the day and you're about to go into combat. Guys, I really can't afford a fight right now. Other great options zone of truth, detect thoughts, enhance ability, lesser restoration, etc, etc. We also get expertise here, so pick your favorite skills and double your proficiency bonus for two of them. I think if it were me for this character, I'm probably going performance and maybe persuasion. You are a bard, after all, and you can't afford to bomb on stage. That would be really bad for album sales. And then at Bard 3, Bards get their subclass, their Bard College. And we really only have two choices here for the path that I've been going down, Valor and Swords. They're the only two that give extra attack, and I think between them, Swords is the superior choice for those focused on increasing their own burst damage capabilities anyway, as we are, as we will discuss in a moment. And so our Barbarian of Righteousness, it turns out, has not been neglecting their skill with the blade despite their focus on their performance skills of late. Our blade may be an axe blade, but that's just semantics. We do get some bonus proficiencies here. They don't do much for us because it's medium armor and the scimitar, which we already have proficiency in, but we are also told that we can now use our weapon as a spellcasting focus for our bard spells. And that's important just in case we decide that it's worth losing rage in the middle of combat to cast a really important spell. We should be able to do so now even with our hands full of axes. Because, just in case you didn't know, we're told in the player's handbook a spellcaster must have a hand free to access a spell's material component or to hold a spellcasting focus, and our weapon is now a spellcasting focus, and it can be the same hand that he or she uses to perform somatic components. So we shouldn't need Warcaster here, even if we want to cast a spell in combat. We also get a fighting style here, and this is another one of the reasons why I wanted to go with double axes, like I said, as opposed to a great axe for this build, because I knew we were going to be going so swords barred for all of the reasons that I've already discussed, and as such, knew that we'd be getting a fighting style. And so, yes, we're going to take the two weapon fighting style, which lets us add our ability score modifier to the damage when we are fighting with a weapon in each hand, and that is a welcome boon. And then as a Swords Bard, we get Blade Flourishes as well. And this is the reason why I preferred Swords Bard over Valor Bard. It's really our first Nova Damage ability, and it's a pretty nice one. When we take the attack action, our move speed increases by 10 feet until the end of the turn, which is really nice. And then if we hit with a weapon attack, we can spend a use of our Bardic Inspiration and add our Bardic Inspiration die in damage to the attack, plus one of the following flourishes, which lets you add the same number that you rolled for extra damage to your armor class until the start of your next turn. That is pretty fantastic, especially with our mediocre armor class. It's similar to the shield spell and is probably the thing that you should be using most of the time. We also get mobile flourish as an option, which lets you push your target five feet plus the number you rolled for the extra damage and immediately use your reaction to move up to your walking speed to an unoccupied space within five feet of the target. Now, you already got 10 feet of extra move speed here, so now you could go 80 feet of movement this round altogether, so long as you end up after your reaction within five feet of the target. Pretty nice when you need it. But of course, being the damage monkey that I am, I'm going to assume that we're going to use slashing flourish on our Nova round, at least. 
to do that extra damage from our Bardic Inspiration die to a second target that's within five feet of the enemy that we're attacking, therefore technically letting us add, at this point, 2d6 in damage during our Nova round, even though one of those d6s is to a secondary target. Obviously, you're not always going to have another target within five feet, and dealing an extra bit of damage to a second target won't always be the best tactical use of our flourish, but I'm just trying to explore the possible from a damage perspective here, and we're gonna need all the help we can get early on, so that's what I'm going to assume. At level five, we would be a bard four, and we get our first ability score increase or feat. I'm gonna take strength here and bump our strength to 18 to improve our attacks. And then at level six, we would be a bard five. Our bardic inspiration die goes to a d8, uh, which means more damage on our flourishes when we use them, and also, of course, better support for our allies when we're not being selfish jerks. Even better, our Bardic Inspiration now resets on a short rest thanks to Font of Inspiration, which is huge, so that means we can use our Bardic Inspirations three times per short rest now, and that will allow us to support our allies and or get a little more damage a lot more frequently. And then we also get third level spells here. Level five bard is a big deal for us. Again, pick your favorites. There's some great options here. Catnap, Dispel Magic, Tiny Hut, Motivational Speech, Sending. These would all be great out of combat options. And let's be very clear here. You are a pretty great utility and support character at the moment. And at the end of the day, that's what bards excel at, right? And I need you to keep that in mind as we go into our first damage report. <laughs> to this point, and even for the next couple of levels, you you are not going to be doing a lot of damage. You are mostly a bard, and so naturally you're a lot better at supporting your allies than you are at killing things. Now, you can hold your own in a fight because of some of the decisions that we've made, but you're not going to be keeping up with builds that thus far have just focused on really trying to optimize for damage yet. Now, before we get into what the numbers look like, let me just say that if you are more interested in a character who is built for better damage early on and you still want to be a barbarian, even though that will come at the cost of burst damage later, not to mention, of course, all of the bard things that you're able to do right now, stay tuned. I'm going to discuss an alternative barbarian build in the final thoughts. All right, right. For our first damage report, our Nova round is basically rage on round one, make an attack. And then on round two, this is our big Nova round, you get two Great Axe attacks, right? One with your action and one with your bonus action for 1d8 each plus two for rage plus four for strength. And then you use Slashing Flourish the first time that we hit for 1d8 more damage on two targets, ideally, for a total of 4d8 plus 12. Yikes. So against an enemy with a 10 armor class, you would do on average... 29 damage, and against an enemy with a 15 armor class, that would be 23 damage during your burst round. Okay, that's worse than any other damage-focused build I've done to date at this level. But again, we are not really built for damage yet. We're built for bard, and we're a decent little bard. So rest assured that the value that you bring to your party is still very high, and just trust me, it is going to get a lot better pretty quickly here. So hang on. At level seven, we would be a bard six, and finally we get extra attack. Oh, this build would have been a lot less painful if we could have just gotten that at level five like most marshals, but we are happy to get it here finally. Oh, and we also get um, one of the crappier bard features here as well, <laughs> counter charm. As an action, you can start a performance that lasts until the end of your next turn, and during that time, you and your allies within 30 feet who can hear you have advantage on saves against being frightened or charmed. That's a pretty steep cost to pay. I mean, once in a while, I can see this being useful, but I think that most of the time, the cost probably outweighs the benefit here. At level eight, at this point in our character's career, I think they realize that their focus on performance has perhaps distanced them somewhat from the deity whose truth they have been trying to proclaim. They might feel a pull to dedicate themselves a little more fully to their devotion and religion, to see if they can't rekindle some additional zeal within themselves and draw upon that deity's 
power with greater strength. So whatever your reasons, we're going to take some paladin levels now. So as a paladin, at level one, we get divine sense, which allows us to sense the presence of undead, celestials, and fiends within 60 feet, not behind total cover. Charisma modifier times per day. Situationally kind of useful once in a while. And then we get lay on hands, further adding to our support capabilities. We get five points per paladin level per day that we can use to heal, one hit point per point spent, or five lay on hands points to cure a disease or a poison. And then at level nine, we're a paladin two. And finally, this is where our Nova damage really skyrockets. As a paladin at level two, we get a fighting style. I think I'd probably go defense here to just to add plus one to our armor class. It's not gonna help a ton, but it will help a little and we could use whatever help we can get. That said, if you wanted to lean even further into your support capabilities, interception would be a nice way to reduce damage dealt to a nearby ally with your reaction. We also get paladin spells here, and as with bard spells, there aren't really any that I'm going to plan on using in combat, at least during our Nova round, so there are some okay utility things here for paladins like purify food and drink or ceremony. Pick your favorites. And then, of course, the main reason that we're here, we finally get Divine Smite. And at this point in our character's career, everything changes. We go from being basically a support focused character who can mix it up in melee a bit to suddenly a zealot of holy destruction. And if I were playing this build in game, I would really want this moment to be like a big story beat moment for my character. So talk it over with your DM. All of a sudden, you discover either some well of power within yourself or have some kind of epiphany or breakthrough, or you tap into the divine power in a major way. Maybe you have your first single to hit number one on the charts. I don't know, but all of a sudden, when you hit with a melee attack, you can add 2d8 of radiant damage to the attack, and that scales by 1d8 per spell level, capping at 5d8 with a fourth level spell slot spent. And here's the thing. Because we put priority on Bard for all those levels, because we paid our dues, striving to make everyone around us better. By the time we get to this point in our career, we suddenly have, thanks to multiclassing, the spell slots of a seventh level full caster, meaning that yes, we now have a fourth level spell slot and three third level spell slots and our Nova damage just goes bonkers. It's funny because usually when I'm adding smite to a character for Nova damage, I tend to pick it up fairly early in the character's career and then kind of grow into it slowly with more spell slot levels. This is the first time I've ever just gone from zero to a hundred like this with a character and it's kind of fun and I would really love to see that transition in game. So let's talk about what that looks like with another damage report. At this point, we are now making three attacks with our battle axes instead of two adding our strength and our rage bonuses to the attacks, and then during our Nova round, adding our slashing flourish to one of those attacks. And then now, if we wanted, we could also add 5d8 to one of the attacks and 4d8 to the other two, thanks to Smite. And so, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would do 99 damage on average. And against an enemy with a 16 armor class, we would do 71 damage on average. So we've basically quadrupled our damage during our Nova round with just three little character levels. That feels pretty amazing, and it takes us from worst of all time to like middle of the pack when compared to other tier two Nova builds. And again, in case you don't know, check the video description. I put graphs and spreadsheets that go over the numbers and make comparisons. And so we're in a pretty happy place right now, especially for a character who spent most of our life being primarily a support character. And again, let's be clear, this character could still be a pretty solid support and utility character outside of combat, or heck, even inside of combat if you wanted to forego your rage benefits once in a while. And you still can be throwing out some of those bardic inspirations and stuff like that without losing rage. So lots of great support and utility features with big big burst damage capabilities. At level 10, this newfound strength and power that has been endowed to us from on high has sparked within us a desire, I think, to return to our roots a little bit, to find and feed the rage within us in the quest for a purer, 
hotter zeal. We want to stoke the fire of our anger that has lain largely dormant for too long. And so it's time to return to the barbarian path for a bit to re-engage with our primal fury. We're going barbarian two here. And as such, we would get danger sense. That gives us advantage on dexterity saving throws versus things we can see like traps or spells. It would be a little more useful if we had a higher dexterity modifier, but it will help us succeed once in a while when we would have failed otherwise. So that's nice. And then we get the very important feature reckless attack, which tells us that when we make our first attack on our turn, we can decide to attack recklessly, thereby getting advantage on all attacks made during this turn. So not on opportunity attacks, for example, as that's not on your turn, but at the very expensive cost of granting your enemies advantage on their attacks against you until your next turn. That's a pretty steep price, but raging zealots of righteous destruction don't really care that much for their own well-being, right? Any sacrifice in Tempest's name is a blessing and an honor to make. This is one of, if not the easiest, ways for any character in D&D to get advantage. It was a shame to put it off this long, but delaying extra attack was already so painful. Anyway, it does wonders for our damage numbers, though, especially now. At level 11, we would be a Barbarian 3, and we get our third rage in a day. This is important. It might have been yet another reason for you to start with more levels of Barbarian. At our table, the truth is we almost never have more than two combat encounters in a day. I appreciate that that might be a little abnormal, but I think it's pretty safe to say that most of you probably are only seeing two to four combat encounters per day. So if you tend to be in the three to four per day range, going Barbarian three before anything might be even more advisable for you. But then we also here get our Barbarian subclass, our Primal Path. And we, of course, if you haven't guessed it yet, are going with the Path of the Zealot. I think it fits perfectly for the theme that we've gone for thus far, with our Paladin levels especially. And it's probably my favorite Barbarian subclass, I think. I also really love Ancestral Guardian, but I also really like to tank, so anyway. Here's a snippet of what we read about the Zealot Barbarian. Some deities inspire their followers to pitch themselves into a ferocious battle fury. These barbarians are zealots, warriors who channel their rage into powerful displays of divine power. <laughs> Perfect. So, as a Zealot Barbarian, we get Divine Fury, which tells us that while you're raging, the first creature you hit on each of your turns takes an extra 1d6 plus half your barbarian levels, so 1, in damage. You choose if it's radiant damage or necrotic damage when you gain this feature, so choose wisely. Probably want to go radiant, I think, but maybe you'll want to hedge your bets and go necrotic since Divine Smite is radiant damage. Anyway, that's a nice little damage bump for us. And then we also get Warrior of the Gods, which as much as I love more damage, this might actually be my favorite feature of the Zealot. And probably because I very often play my character like throwing caution to the wind and maybe a little bit of a glass cannon. So it's so perfect for what this character embodies, I think. If a spell brings you back to life, not to undeath, but actual life, so revivify for example, the caster doesn't need material components, which is fantastic because those spells always have very expensive material components, diamonds typically, which are consumed in the casting of the spell. So now it's like you are bound for glorious battle, whether in this life or the next, and your soul is happy to flow from one realm to the next so long as you can fight. As long as you have someone in your party with revivify or something better and a spell slot to cast it with, you truly do not fear death, for it holds very little power over you. At level 12, we're going to be fighter one. You knew I was going this route, right? Of course you did. Now, you don't have to do this. You might want to just go back to bard levels now, I think. But with as much time as we have been playing, focused mostly on support, we've got the burst damage bit in our teeth, and it's very hard to let go. We still have some ground to make up, numbers-wise. As a fighter, level 1, we get second wind, which lets us, as a bonus action, 
once per short rest, recover hit points equivalent to a d10 plus our fighter level. That's really nice, especially for those of us who have resistance to most of the damage that we're going to be taking. And then we also get a fighting style. Three fighting styles on one character? Yeesh. I would probably take superior technique here. It lets us learn one Battlemaster maneuver and then get one d6 superiority die per short rest to fuel that maneuver with. Precision attack would probably be really good to make sure that we landed a big hit during our Nova round, but I think for me, I'm probably gonna go menacing attack especially for this build. So with menacing attack, you would add the superiority die in damage when you hit, and then the target has to make a wisdom saving throw, or they are frightened of you until the end of your next turn. And I just think that this character would be like one of the scariest things on the planet when they had their rage up and they were in full Nova mode. I mean, you saw that picture by Randall, right? Freaky. And I love the added flavor of striking fear into your target's heart. The only thing scarier than death metal is righteous death metal. And then at level 13, we would be a fighter too, and we get action surge. So yes, now once per short rest, we get to take two actions on a turn, and that means two more rage-fueled, smite-fueled attacks should we choose to use them. And so it's time for another damage report at level 13. And now for our Nova round, we would be throwing down the same three attacks as last time, with the same smites and the same flourish, but this time with advantage, thanks to Reckless Attack, and we would also be adding 1d6 plus 1 in damage from Divine Fury and 1d6 in damage from our Menacing Attack to the first attack that we land. But then, in addition, we would Action Surge and get two more attacks with a third level and a second level smite, respectively, if we wanted to burn all of that in one round. As always, I'm not necessarily saying that we should, but exploring the possible and thus if we did against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would do on average 172 damage. And against an enemy with a 17 armor class, it would be 155 damage. Almost double last time, which was quadruple the time before. And so at this point, we are like at the top of the class compared to other tier two Nova damage builds at this level. Woohoo! I don't think a metalhead barbarian would say woohoo. All right, coming down the home stretch at level 14, our zealous barbarian is now at the pinnacle of their glory. They have been honing their craft, melding a perfect harmony of martial prowess, righteous fervor, and skilled musicianship. I think it's time to go back to Bard here to finish our career in pursuit of performance perfection. How's that for some alliteration? And so we would be a Bard 7 and we get fourth level Bard spells. Pick your favorites as always, focusing on out of combat options or non-concentration options, things like Dimension Door, Freedom of Movement, Greater Invisibility, I think, non-combat Polymorph. Uh, or maybe even locate creature, all great choices among others. At level 15, we would be a bard eight, and we finally get another ability score increase or feat. I wanna bump our strength and take it to 20. Can't believe it took us this long. Oh, who am I kidding? Or a barbarian with fighter and paladin dips. Of course, it took us this long. <laughs> we also get fifth level spell slots, thanks to multi-classing. So in case there was something that we wanted to upcast, uh, namely more big divine smites, keep that in mind. At level 16, we would be a Bard 9. Our Song of Rest goes to a D8, so teeny little bump there for some additional healing on a short rest. And then we would get 5th level Bard spells. Definitely going to want to consider things like Greater Restoration, Raise Dead, Mass Cure Wounds, all the usual suspects of great support spells. But there are, I think especially at this level, even some nice ones that you might want to consider using in combat, maybe once you're done with your Nova round. Or if you're out of rage uses for the day, you know, Animate Objects, Dominate Person, Hold Monster, Synaptic Static. Lots of great ones to choose from. And then finally, for us anyway, at level 17, we would be a Bard 10, meaning that we would have six level spell slots, among other things. Our Bardic Inspiration die goes to a D10. That's nice. So a little more damage on our flourishes and a little more help to those that were inspiring. We do get another round of expertise here as well. So we can now pick two more of our most important skills that you didn't take expertise in last time and double the proficiency bonus for them. And then we get as a Bard 10 magical secrets. 
and Magical Secrets is amazing. And it lets us learn two spells from any class so long as they are spells of a level we can cast as shown on the bard table. And that's an important qualifier here, meaning that even though we do have sixth level spell slots now, as per the bard table, we can only cast fifth level bard spells at the moment. It's a wee bit confusing, I know, but just know that this is going to give us two fifth level spells or lower from any spell class spell list. Hmm. I am very curious to know which ones you would choose. There are so many fantastic options. I actually really like the commune spell here. It's a ritual spell and it really feels appropriate for this character. I think letting you contact your deity and ask them three yes or no questions, which could provide some fantastic utility and guidance as well as really fun, I think, character interaction moments. Telepathic bond could be a super useful ritual, letting you communi communicate telepathically with your allies for an hour. Wall of force, of course, is an incredible control option that doesn't require a saving throw, which is really important for us because our charisma is only a 16 still. Death Ward lasts for eight hours. It doesn't require concentration and is fairly thematic, I think, for this character especially. I think my number one go-to choice though here would be Find Greater Steed because I want to ride a griffin into battle. Like, I can think of maybe three, <laughs> like, metal albums where you have a character like riding into battle on the back of a flying creature and you know find greater steed is awesome because it lets you summon the steed and then it just lasts until it dies it doesn't require your concentration right so anyway let me know what you would choose in the comments. And so, for our final damage report then at level 17, the only real difference from last time that we checked is that we finally have a strength score that is capped. We have a lot more higher level spell slots to smite with. I mean, we have one sixth level spell slot, two fifth level spell slots, and three fourth level spell slots, meaning that if we wanted to, again, not saying that we should, we could smite for 5d8 on every single one of of our five attacks we would get during our Nova round with Action Surge and not even have to use that sixth level spell slot to do it. Also, our Bardic Inspiration die went up to a d10 for our flourish. And thus, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we will break the Bicentennial Barrier, 203 damage on average. And against an enemy with an 18 armor class, it's still fantastic, 189. And that keeps us comfortably among the upper levels of other tier 2 Nova damage builds. Not bad at all. So, final thoughts. Our average tier score here, when compared to other Nova damage builds, ends up at 109. So, overall, in the bottom half of the tier 2 builds, but again, that's mostly because our early numbers were so low. And speaking of damage, I promised a better damage early on alternative to the Barbarian that we built, and it's basically this in a nutshell. You would start with Barbarian, take Barbarian to level 5, letting you get Rage, Reckless Attack, you know, your Zealot features, and extra attack earlier on, it's going to have you hitting a lot harder. I think I probably would go Great Weapon Master and Polearm Master for my free feat and then my feat at level 4, because even though we would likely be turning off Great Weapon Master when we wanted to Nova later with our smites, it would still add a lot of damage to our sustained damage outside of our Nova rounds and even to our Nova round here early. Then from levels six to eight, I think I'd go Bard, but for the subclass, instead of Swords, I'd go Whispers, giving us Psychic Blades to add to our Nova rounds and a really cool fear ability, which I think is thematic. From there, I take two levels of Paladin for Smite, two levels of Fighter for Action Surge, and then finish off the build with Bard levels again. Here's the reality though. The damage numbers would look a lot better at level six. I mean, almost double, but you would lose those support features that you were getting from those early Bard levels. And then 
at levels 9 and 13 when you check the numbers for those damage reports it's actually 20 percent less or so on our nova round because we're behind in our bard level so the spell slot progression now you might not care too much about it because your campaign might end at level 8 or whatever right but regardless then at the end at level 17 this version of the build does surpass the one that we did just by a little bit due to psychic blade scaling as well as some other things you know once the spell slot progression finally catches up but i'm gonna be honest I really love sort of the versatility and even the metamorphosis of the Barbarian the way we built it. It's really fun, I think, to see such a stark difference between playing one way and then in the blink of an eye, suddenly being able to add a completely new and really powerful component to what you bring to the table with your character. And you know, even once you get that big burst damage ability, again, you are still capable of being a pretty decent support and utility character outside of your Nova round. And I seem to be creating more and more of these types of characters lately. Support characters who also bring a lot of damage potential, often in burst form, right? The Mercy Monk was this way. Um, I, I think I have some cards to spare this week. The, the, uh, the Death Knight was this way probably several others that I'm just not thinking of off the top of my head. But honestly, like when I play a support character in D&D going forward, I really do think that I'll play a character with this kind of functionality. Big burst damage capability, as well as some decent support options. You know, oftentimes, a D&D campaign can run months or even years before it's completed, right? And while, of course, we all love all of our characters to death, I think at times there's a risk over months and especially years that we might crave a little variety in the playstyle of our character. Now sometimes that naturally comes with a character as you say get better spells to play with for example, but especially for martial characters I think the playstyle can sometimes get a little samesy throughout your career. Not with the zealous barbarian though. They bring a diversity of playstyle that rocks. <laughs> uh, that was cheesy, I know. But anyway, that's the build for the week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I certainly had a blast creating it, even though it took me forever to figure out how I wanted to build it. I love you guys. You're so fantastic. Thank you so much for all of your support. I hope I hope you will like the video and subscribe to the channel if you're not, and even consider joining as a member. But more importantly, I hope you have a fantastic day. I hope you have a fantastic week. And I hope to see you again very soon. So until then, take care, have fun, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Ah! What happened to my hair? Did I join the military or something? La 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 la. La 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 la. Watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. Maybe somebody gave me a better suggestion on Discord. Hurry, check. Nope. No better suggestions. Waiting for Bizzini. You surely are a meanie. Just a little patience. Yeah. You can add 2d8 of rate. I've been walking the streets at night. I'm only gonna get one more ability score increase with this character. Welcome to the jungle. We got fun and games. And add our bardic inspiration die in damage to the attack. Whoa. <laughs> great axe attacks. Say that five, five times fast. Great axe attacks. Great axe attacks. Great axe attacks. Can't do it. I burped my way out of my train of thought.